your heart and your mind and cause you to seek for a deeper relationship and more powerful relationship with Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Please bow your heads as we pray today. Jesus, we love you. You're an awesome and incredible God. Your word is powerful and unlimited. And I pray today that your word would minister to each of us. Start with me, Lord, and, and I pray that everyone who hears this message would respond to you and to the calling of your spirit on their hearts, their minds, and their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the beginning of the relationship, King Saul and David, they got along quite well. But there came a time when the sinfulness of humanity caused a division between Saul and David. Eventually, Saul hated David and sought to kill his, uh, take his life. When King Saul had sent his servants one time to kill David, in an effort to help David, David's wife, Michael, the daughter of Saul, told David in 1 Samuel 19.11, If thou save not thy life tonight, tomorrow thou shalt be slain. And that is the title of today's message. Tonight, tomorrow, what's the difference? Tonight, tomorrow, what's the difference? And in that verse, he, uh, Michael told David, If thou save not thy life tonight, tomorrow thou shalt be slain. Michael was warning David, you have, one, you have one chance, you have just one chance to save your life. You must save yourself tonight. If not, tomorrow you will surely be killed. Those must have been incredibly disheartening words for Michael to say. And even more insanely chilling words for David to hear. For words like that to ring around your heart and your mind. Being told, escape tonight or die tomorrow. Those are your only two choices. All I can say to that is, wow. I cannot fathom those being my two choices. Escape tonight or die tomorrow. David, he did not want to be killed. David did not want his life to be over. But there was an enemy seeking to take his life. And so David, he had to do something. He responded to the warning. David responded to the warning. And he reacted in a way that would save his life. There's an old hymn. And the lyrics go like this. Troublesome times are here. Filling men's hearts with fear. Freedom we all hold dear. Now is at stake. Humbling your hearts to God saves from the chastening rod. Seek the way pilgrims trod. Christians awake. Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many will meet their doom. Trumpets will sound. All the dead shall rise. Righteous meet in the skies. Going where no one dies. Come heavenward bound. And today, I am challenging you. You are being challenged. To save your life. The preacher said in Ecclesiastes chapter 9. I returned and saw unto the sun. That the race is not to the swift. Nor the battle to the strong. Neither yet bread to the wise. Nor yet riches to men of understanding. Nor yet favor to men of skill. But time and chance happeneth to them all. And this includes you. And this includes me. And Jesus said. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 45, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth the rain on the just and on the unjust. And in Proverbs chapter 27, verse 1, boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. So today I implore you, I ask you, I even beg you to please hear me tell you, save your life now. Do what it takes to be saved. The prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 55, verse 6, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his ways and the unrighteous man his thoughts, and let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. You do not have the promise of tomorrow. I do not have the promise of tomorrow. You do not have the promise of even your very next breath. And while we sit here today, you could pass away. And you really only have right here and right now. And do not think, oh, but I'm not like David. Nobody.
he's warning me, escape tonight or lose your life tomorrow. Saul and his servants are not waiting outside to kill me. Saul and his servants are not just waiting for the morning light to take my life. Saul and his servants are long gone from this earth. But you need to know this. 1 Peter 5, 8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. There is a spiritual enemy, and yes, he wants you. But there is also a God who loves you, and he cares for you. For the eyes of the Lord run to and, uh, to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of them whose heart is per perfect toward him. He loves you, and he cares about you. He wants to show himself strong on your behalf. And the prophet Isaiah said in chapter 59, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save. Neither is his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. He is watching, and he is waiting, and he's looking for you. God is watching and waiting for you. You have not gone too far. You have not made too many mistakes. You are not Saul, and you are not Judas. You can seek the Lord today. And you can be forgiven today. And you can be filled with the Holy Ghost just like they were in Acts chapter 2 and throughout the book of Acts. You can be filled with the Holy Ghost and have a life-changing, powerful, spiritual experience. The psalmist said in the 103rd Psalm, For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. God can and God will forgive you because of his great mercy. He's a graceful God. He's a merciful God. And the psalmist said and prayed this. I said, Lord, be merciful unto me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. Repentance is absolutely necessary. And it's well recorded in the Psalter in Psalm 116. Gracious is the Lord, and righteous, yea, our God is merciful. He's a graceful God. He's a merciful God. He's a loving God. And in Lamentations, chapter 3, verse 21, This I recall to my mind, therefore have I hope. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed, because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. Your life is between you and God, and no other man. The Apostle Paul commended us to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling in Philippians chapter 2. Do not be fooled. Do not be misled by any other person. You are responsible for you. You have access to the Word of God. We live in a free country. You can open the Word of God and seek it for yourself and find out for yourself. You have the responsibility for your soul. And the prophet Isaiah said, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. We have been preaching it for so many years, and you know it well. You've heard it, and you know it. And the apostle Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 5, 2, For yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. There is coming a day when you will no longer have the opportunity to repent. There is coming a day when you will no longer be able to seek the Lord. And we know in the book of 1 Samuel, in chapter 16, the Bible says, But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. If the man who was anointed to be king of Israel, a man who was chosen by God, and God told him, to this, in 1 Samuel 9, 2, Saul, a choice young man and a goodly, and there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than Saul. Saul was anointed by Samuel. If Saul could suffer the Spirit of the Lord departing from him forever, you need to know this today. There is a day coming when salvation will not be found anymore. In Jeremiah 26, 13, therefore now amend your ways and your doings. And obey the voice of the Lord your God. 
and the Lord will repent him of the evil that he has pronounced against you. Yes, God is a loving God. God is a graceful God, and God is a merciful God. Yes, he loves you, and he's seeking to help you and to save you, but he has created a plan by which you and I, we get to choose where and how we will spend eternity. You must make a choice. I must make a choice to love and to serve God and to choose eternity with God. And you need to make that choice today. You will not just happen to go to heaven. All roads do not lead to heaven. There's a saying, all dogs go to heaven. I love dogs. So I would love for that to be true. However, I don't know about that, but I do know about this. All people will not be in heaven. There will be a great catching away someday, and everyone is not going to meet the Lord in the air. But 2 Peter 3, chapter, chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us were, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Verse 10 says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also, and the works that are therein, shall be burned up. 2 Peter 3.11 Seeing them, that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? And then look at this in verse 12. He says, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of the Lord, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth the righteous. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent, be diligent, that ye may be found of him in peace without spot, and blameless. We do not know when the trumpet will sound. We do not know when the rapture will happen. But this is what we know, is that the trumpet will sound one of these days. And we know that those who obey the word of God, they will be the ones who will be caught up to meet the Lord in the air. Those will be the ones who will be Jesus in heaven. Those who explicitly obey the word of God. All roads do not lead to heaven. Yes, God is graceful. God is merciful. God is kind. God is loving. But he is also a very particular God. Throughout the Bible, from the beginning of his word to the end of his word, we see people who did not specifically obey his instructions, and they were severely punished. Moses, the man that God chose to lead Israel in the greatest escape known to humanity, he was not allowed to enter into the promised land because he did not explicitly obey God's word. Saul, the man whom God asked Samuel to anoint to be the king of Israel, could not keep the throne, and he could not have his own son succeed him on the throne, because he did not explicitly obey God. You must explicitly obey the word of God if you want to spend eternity with Jesus Christ. Jesus said in Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them who believe. In my name they shall cast out devils, they shall speak with new tongues. And Jesus said in Matthew 28, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And we know his name is Jesus. He has all power in heaven and earth. His name is Jesus, so we baptize in Jesus' name. In Acts chapter 2, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave the utterance. And while Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost, the people who were there in the streets listening to Peter preach, they said this. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, 
What shall we do? Men and brethren, what shall we do? And Peter responded to them. He said, you repent of your sins and you be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. But it does not end there with Peter preaching to those people on that day. In Acts chapter 2, on the day of Pentecost, Peter continued for you and for me. He said, for the promises unto you and to your children and to all who are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. The promise of being filled with the Holy Ghost is for you and it's for me. And this is the road to heaven. Repentance of all your sins. Being baptized in the water in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And being filled with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. In Acts chapter 8, the Samaritans, they had repented of their sins. They had been baptized in the water in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins. But they had not received the Holy Ghost. So Peter and John went down to pray for them. Think about it. They had repented of their sins, been baptized in the water. But everyone knew they had not received the Holy Ghost. The Bible says in Acts 8.15, Who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them. Only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. The Samaritans had repented of their sins. The Samaritans had been baptized in the water in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. But they had not received the Holy Ghost. How did anyone know this? Because they had not spoken in other tongues. There was no sign. There was no evidence. There is evidence when God does something for you. And that's why God gives you the evidence of speaking in other tongues when he fills you with his spirit. So that you have no doubt that you have the spirit of God living inside of you. It was so powerful that in verse 18, when Simon saw that through the laying on of hands, the Holy Ghost was given. He offered them money, saying, give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. This was not a just come and kneel at the altar kind of moment. This wasn't a I accept the Lord as my personal Savior and that's it kind of moment. It was a life-changing moment. It was a life-altering moment. It was a life-giving moment. It was a, it was a great event in their life. Being filled with the Holy Ghost is awesome. It's incredible. And the same thing happened in Acts chapter 10 at Cornelius' home. Verse 44 says, When Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision, which believed, were astonished. They were astonished because they heard other people speaking in tongues. As many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Why would they be astonished if there wasn't some amazing sign? For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. The evidence of speaking in tongues is how each person knew individually. And how all of them knew collectively that they had been filled with the Holy Ghost. So know this today. You are not promised tomorrow. Michael told David there, Saul's servants are outside waiting to kill you. Escape tonight or die tomorrow. You and I, we don't have the promise of tomorrow. But God's word is abundantly clear. You must repent of your sins. You must be baptized in the water in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you will be filled with the Holy Ghost. But the evidence is speaking in other tongues. And that is the way to heaven. That is the way to eternity with Jesus Christ. So today, repent and be baptized in the name above every name, the name of Jesus Christ. Find a church that will baptize you the correct way, the biblical way, and seek for God to fill you with the Spirit until you speak with other tongues and you know that you have a life-changing, life-altering, incredible event. You're welcome here at First Pentecostal Church of Marion, Indiana. We want you to come. We want to pray with you. We want to baptize you in the water. In the name of Jesus Christ. And I pray that this message moves you to think about it. You're not promised tomorrow. None of us are. But we do have the promise of God's word. That if we will get our lives right, we'll spend eternity with him. Jesus, I pray that you would anoint this word to every person who hears it. I pray that they would dive into the Bible and find out for themselves what your word says about repentance, about baptism, about the power of your name, about being washed in your blood and being filled with the Spirit. We give you glory, we give you honor, we give you praise for all things.